The chairman, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for inviting me. My task today will be to review the risk of exercise in cardiomyopathies. More specifically, I will speak about the risk of arrhythmia and the risk of disease progression. And we can speak about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, dilated cardiomyopathy, and I want to add to the discussion the left ventricular non-compaction. There are quite a few guidelines and position papers, but I did not get good answers from these documents. So let's go to history. Conventional wisdom before we had science. The grandmother was saying, if you got a flu, stay in bed, and if you have a sick heart, keep at rest. Today we know that some of the people with the flu have an asymptomatic myocarditis. So the prevalence of sudden death among athletes and among military recruits having myocarditis on autopsy is between 6 and 20 percent. A second example deals with the story of the world sickest heart described on the pages of circulation. Several years later we found out that this is not a regular hypertrophic cardiomyopathy but a metabolic disease caused by LAMP2 mutation named Denon disease. This 14 years old athlete had syncope at 14 because of VT. At that time he had wall thickness of 60, WPW, and he had a good ventricular function. Several years later he went to heart failure with reduced function and thinner walls, and he was dead at 22. Again, it's only one example, it's not scientific. He had a brother. The brother had CP, so he was wheelchair bound. At 16, he had no hypertrophy. At 22, he had wall thickness of 16, and the ejection fraction was not normal, but he was not in heart failure. The disease is caused by arrested autophagy. Autophagy is a process where the cell recycles its own contents, which are aged and needed to be degraded. When we exercise, the cell adapts by increasing autophagy. The disease arrests autophagy, so the cell is stuck with these undegraded contents. This is probably the first documented Israeli patient with Denon disease. At 1960, we did not know he had Denon disease. He was flown to the US to underwent a pacemaker implantation through Paris. Several years later, a family was described, and 30 years later, a molecular diagnosis was established. The difference was that this guy died at age of 45 of heart failure. He had a Jewish mother, so, so from a very young age he was told to do nothing, stay at rest. <laughs> now let's go back to science. Does physical activity increase the arrhythmic risk in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? Answer number one is that there are no randomized studies, so we can do some assumptions from published literature. The disease prevalence is one in 500, and probably less than that in athletes. If we have a 36% HCM on autopsy in suddenly dying athletes, it means that the prevalence is higher in athletes. This is a famous Italian study. They checked 300 autopsies, 55 athletes, and 245 non-athletes. And they had higher prevalence of sudden death during athletic activity, but they did not have HCM among athletes. They still had 8% HCM in the cohort. 
So patients with HCM, even without exercising, they keep dying, and many of them keep dying from sudden death. Sudden death accounts for more than 50% of death causes in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and mostly it occurs at rest or even at sleep. Does physical activity causes disease progression in HCM? Question number one, does it worsen hypertrophy? I don't have a good answer, but probably not to a great extent. The second question is, does it cause ischemia and fibrosis? And here we do have evidence to show that hypertrophic cardiomyopathy suffer from microvascular dysfunction. And here we have a PET showing decreased perfusion, and this is associated with areas of fibrosis as found here on autopsy. Microvascular dysfunction is responsible for ischemia, fibrosis, and disease progression in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Myocardial oxygen demand is increased by tachycardia, by intraventricular pressions. That means by exercise. So the answer to the second question is yes. There is a study showing that some of the patients with HCM develop arrhythmia during exercise test, and this is associated with adverse prognosis. And another issue to mention is exhaustion. Mortality during marathon is higher during the last part of the race, and in this U.S. cohort, nearly 50% of the patient had HCM or suspected HCM. Uh, let's move to ARVC. Does physical activity increase the arrhythmia risk in ARVC? Italians are very good in ARVC. And definitely, there is a five-fold increase in sudden death in ARVC during physical activity. And in athletes, we can appreciate that most of the cases of sudden death occur during exercise. From more recent studies, we know that ARVC patients develop arrhythmia during provocation testing, such as infusion of catecholamines or exercise testing. This study shows that they not only expose premature ventricular beats with LBBB morphology, but they even may develop Epsilon waves following the exercise, while at rest they are considered to be asymptomatic and not expressing the phenotype. So exercise may help us to diagnose ARVC. Further, there is a recent study showing that in gene carriers, history of physical activity is associated with earlier and with more severe disease expression. A new topic which was presented during the last several years is whether exercise may cause ARVC. And this is because studies in athletes following strenuous endurance exercise showed dilation of the right ventricle and transient reduction in right ventricular function. And there are works showing that when people are exposed to repeat bouts of severe exercise, there may be chronic changes in the right ventricle and even indications of fibrosis by MRI gadolinium. A paradigm was put forward that in certain predisposed individuals, exercise training causes dilatation and disruption of interventricular conne intercellular connections, which may result in arrhythmia and in fibrosis, an ARVC-like condition. I must tell you that not everybody agrees 
to this paradigm. This is a very detailed study by Sharma and co-workers in a large series of athletes. And they have shown that indeed right ventricular dimensions fall in the ARVC range in many athletes of both races, males and females. And when you add to that inverted T waves in the precordial leads, it really creates a suspicion of ARVC. But more detailed studies like exercise, like MRI, do not confirm increased or causality between exercise and ARVC. I am moving to dilated cardiomyopathy, which represents a wide spectrum of disease entities. DCM is the least common cause of sudden death in sudden death series among athletes. DCM is compatible with good aerobic performance over a wide range of ejection fractions. Many of these people, when asymptomatic, may exercise. And actually, exercise training leads to subjective and objective improvement in ARVC, in, in DCM. We also have basic studies suggesting that exercise may protect from disease progression. However, there are caveats. There is a decreased coronary flow reserve in DCM, and many of them have a decreased contractile reserve, and both of these are independent predictors of survival, of bad survival. Some of the DCMs have inflammatory conditions, they have an inflammatory cardiomyopathy which predisposes to arrhythmia. Some of the patients harbor desmosome mutations, those which cause ARVC, and actually the disease expresses first in the left ventricle. So we call it left ventricular arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. And we know also to associate increase the arrhythmia risk with functional class of heart failure and with low ejection fraction. And finally, there are specific genetic subtypes associated with ventricular arrhythmia, like lamin mutations, like sodium channel mutations, and there are more. So this is a very nice basic science paper in mice mice who have DCM by lamin mutation, and these mice are protected when they are trained. So it's as good to do exercise training in mice to prevent DCM as to give them carvedilol. These mice do not tolerate aortic bending, but they like swimming. The story is different when you examine a cohort of lamin mutation causing human DCM. This study was done on 94 subjects with DCM mutations. They had 43 heart failure and sudden death events. And the independent predictors of bad prognosis were functional class and previous history of endurance training. So there is a note of caution regarding physical activity over a long range of time. And the last one is left ventricular non-compaction. Most of them associated with DCM, but some have no other phenotype, only deep trabeculations, and there is quite a dispute about what to do with this patient. The implications are not clear. Increased LV trabeculations are even more common in athletes. According to Sharma, 15, 11% of black athletes and 8% of Caucasians satisfied criteria for left ventricular non-compactions. And a minority of them also had T waves inversion and reduced left ventricular ejection fraction. But most of them, on the overall 8%, did not. And Sharma is very strong against disqualification of these athletes or 
making the criteria in athletes more stringent. But there are other notes of caution. There is a series of cases of syncope with or without sudden death, which is a collection of case reports from patients with left ventricular non-compaction. And some of these individuals harbor surprises and very funny mutations. This is one example. Ryanodin mutations cause CPVT, which is not good for exercise. There is one variant caused by exon 3 deletion, which causes, in addition to CPVT, also dilated cardiomyopathy and AV block. So the authors looked for exon 3 deletion among 24 genotype negative CPVT patients, and they found two. And they extended the study to the families. Seven of eight mutation carriers all had normal ejection fraction, but seven of eight had left ventricular non-compaction. Actually, many of them had non-compaction pattern before expressing the CPVT phenotype. That looks quite scary. I am willing to summarize. I try to do my best to understand what is written in all different guidelines and papers. We probably have to forbid competitive sports in the major cardiomyopathies, and isolated non-compaction is an unresolved issue. Regarding recreational sports, we have to individualize our approach in cardiomyopathies. Dilated cardiomyopathy is the only one where there is evidence that exercise, dynamic exercise, may benefit. I don't know if it benefits the heart, but it definitely may benefit the patient. And left ventricular non-compaction, the restrictions are less stringent, but there is no consensus. There are other unresolved issues. We probably know what to do with apical cardiomyopathy, also I am asked about it over and over again, but what to do about basal septal hypertrophy? What to do about inverted T waves with normal echo and MRI? This question is asked over and over again. What to do with mutation carriers without a phenotype? Now there is a wide screen, widespread use of genetic studies. In my feeling, some of these cases are an abuse. So we are identifying individuals with variants of unknown significance in a disease gene without a phenotype. What to do with them? And if we go further, when we have children of a family member who is affected by cardiomyopathy, Statistically, this, each of these children is at 50% risk of developing a disease. So my patient with basal septal hypertrophy, she did not like my recommendations on her case, so she offered me to read this book, which is a novel about life, and which gives some proportion about what we are doing and how we should instruct people about the health. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, and uh, bravo. It's uh, what's a magnificent talk. Not so easy to do. Magnificent talk. Do you, do you have any question in the room? We have one or two, perhaps. Thank you. It's actually regarding the uh, primary exercise testing functional exercise testing. How reproducible are those tests? Because sometimes we send the patient for this test and we decide very major decisions regarding open heart surgery or transplantation. And uh, it's very important to know if uh, any studies have uh, shown that it's re reproducible. I think uh, Alain Coenzala can answer, or you can answer perhaps, I know, but it's not really your talk. Do you, do, do, Alain, do, do you need a second? 
big VO2 be before taking a decision? That's the question. Yes, sorry. In general, it's, 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 not, recomm it's not recommended to, to pose a, a prognostic assessment only on the first test of the patient. Okay? But the second and the third Stay, tests are very out. reproducible. So the, the first test, you cannot say transplantation after the first test. You have to follow the patient for one month, so, uh, titrate beta blockers, and the second test, now you can really assess the outcome. Really. The first test, I won't, I, I, won't, I won't use it. So forget the first reasons. Uh, question for Dr. Arad. I just, well, well look, it's, it was very interesting. In hepatic cardiomyopathy, for example, you, you underlined the fact that 60% of all patients die at rest. Uh, and the question is why they die, in fact. We know the last event is VF, but the beginning, what is it? Uh, there, there, there are some proof that sometimes it's atrial fib, sometimes it's AV block, sometimes it's falling blood pressure, and sometimes we don't know. Uh, but I don't really know how to predict that, that event in patients with uh, hepatic hemopathy. You, you see patients with very severe disease dying from heart failure and never doing any arrhythmia. So, so do you have any comment on that? Or how, how do we manage all those things? Well, you, you know it much better than me that uh, this is an ongoing discussion and there is an ongoing problem uh, how to risk assess HCM patients. Uh, I think it's beyond the scope of our uh, discussion here, but what is definite is that physical activity increases the arrhythmic risk in this disease. Also, there are no randomized studies. And uh, it probably also enhances disease progression. So we have to And we have ex some example of patients even in France with typical hepatophic cardiomyopathy, football player, who in fact continue to do sports and to do uh, you know, competition and nothing happened. And then at the end, when they are quite old to leave sports, uh, they just say, well, I had the disease, I stopped. They earn a lot of money and they stop after, but nothing had happened. So it's, and I remember one guy in, in the US with a cardiac defibrillator. He was doing competition. <laughs> he was published in the New England, in fact, and nothing happened. Yeah, but that's a matter of statistics, and uh, we also have to think about what happens to myocardial fibrosis, which is supposed to go faster with uh, conditions of increased oxygen demand. Now, there is a huge variability between different individuals and between different mutations, so this phenotype is very variable. We, when we t speak about cohorts, we take the average. We have the prevalence. Uh, of course, it's good to individualize therapy, and everybody, the patient uh, deserves a good the advice to the best of our knowledge. Now, he has to integrate it with his economic considerations and his preferences. Some of them prefer to die and not to discontinue physical activity, but that's his decision. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you to everybody and to the Israeli Heart Society and the Epicardia.